So, Hans and Teutonica, we pointedly waited to do this review. Because for a while... Well, Rim waited. I was fine doing it. Yeah, but we've lately, just due to constraints of time and due to feeling very self-assured in our ability to assess games quickly, have been reviewing games, especially tabletop games, based on one playthrough. Sometimes that's enough. Yep. And you know what? Coup, C-O-U-P, one play was enough. In the case of Hansa Teutonica, one playthrough was also enough, but I had to be sure. Okay. I wanted to give a real deep review of this game. I haven't played it enough to go really deep. I mean, I, we can go deep enough. Played we it like four or five times. We maybe. have not solved it. However, no. I can say this. Hansa Teutonica came out in 2009, Andreas Stedding, is a stand-up tabletop game that is quick to play, quick to teach, and has survived repeated plays with experienced and skilled gamers. That is more than I can say for most tabletop games that have ever existed. Yeah. That's more than I can say for most tabletop games that I own. I think the fundamental thing with Hans Teutonica, right, is you look at a lot of board games out there that have multiple victory conditions or multiple ways, paths to generating victory points. Right? Like Kalis, you can go in the castle, you can try to do the gold thing, you can right. try to do the buildings thing. And in most of those games, Stone in most of those games, one way is just better than the other in way. In Kalis, you should just go for the castle, fuck everything. Else. Right, unless you get some magic jeweler thing. Happening. And even then, he lost by a point. Like, right. it still didn't work. It was just close. Right. But in the five, six times I've played Hans Jutanica, right, all ways are not necessarily viable in a single instance of the game, but across playing the game multiple times, based on what people do, different ones will become the way you should have gone. Like, if the game is going long then the key becomes the way to go. The key and the network and building houses. But right. that means you need your privilege of up. We'll get if to the that game is the really short, right? <laughs> yeah, you then, learn that. Then like one colon is you could, might be enough to win. You and Cold Guy learned that when me and Ro mm. just fucking blitzed the end of the game and left everybody behind. Yeah. And it's like you get like these piddly points like during the course of the game just from building offices. And it's like those points usually don't matter if people get a whole bunch of end of game points, but if you can get enough of those points quickly enough, the game will just fucking end. And then those end of game points will be so insignificant compared to the during game points. So it's like, not only do you have to choose a path of victory, but you have to see how the game is going. And if there's a lot of players, you don't have a lot of control over how the game is going. And you have to play for the path that is going to be the winning path in that game. Yep, and not in Hans Dutanica overall. That is what makes this game so fascinating to me and why I have such a high opinion of it. Because let's look at two similar, like two different directions of game. Agricola has the same, there are multiple paths to victory. But you just get the baby. Yep. Well, get the baby, and yeah. Then, but there's other, like, do you, do you go for house upgrade points? Or do you go for animal points? Well, your cards usually tell you what to do. They do. And the resources available usually tell you what to do. Ah, and so you sort of have to do a little bit of everything to get a good score in that game anyway. Exactly. So you have two things affecting the game in the sense. On one hand, your strategy is driven what? By your preference and your cards. Not so much by what anyone else is doing. So if, if I see Scott's going for a house upgrade, that almost doesn't affect my strategy at all. Unless you were going for house upgrade, now I'm taking it from you. Even then, usually you're not taking it from me because the game's set up to where two people doing the same thing isn't too there's, big. There's the, enough for two people to do the same the thing. Only, there's not enough for three people. Nope. The only game interaction, though, it comes down to blocking Scott's move at a critical point. Oh, you wanted to build the baby. Well, guess what? I'm on the baby. You can't build the baby this turn. That, that kind of blocking other players is all that matters. And two, the game has extremely diminishing returns in every victory point direction, forcing you to do all of them at least a little. Now, go in the other direction. A game like El Grande has the direct player fucking, the direct player interaction. Everything I do directly relates to what you do and before and after what I do. I move some pieces there. You have to react to that. The game is so reactive. Your strategy has to be so high level and meta. But as a result, the game is almost purely political. Hansa Teutonica has the direct interaction. The game is extremely reactionary. Your strategy mostly has to revolve around reacting to other players on a tactical level and maybe changing strategies mid-game. Mm. But at the same time, you still have this solitaire sort of build-up optimization. It takes the best aspects of a game like Agricola and the best aspects of a game like El Grande and mashes them together into something that's actually really quick to play. Right. So the way the game works, generally, is that you have... 
uh, cubes and discs. Fuck what they're actually named. Oh, yeah, actually, we got it. We get, so, problem with this game. The rule book is garbage. Uh, we complain about rule books and tabletop games being poorly written for the last decade. It's not decade. as bad as Attica. No. Uh, not but, Attica. Um... Uh, 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 Hella, Hellas. 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 It's not as bad as Hellas. Attica's fine. Attica's got fine rules. Attica's fine. Hellas but is the bad. Read the rules Greek to an old, <laughs> an old game like Puerto Rico or Tigger's and Euphrates or Bonanza, and then read the rules of Hansa Teutonica, and I defy you not to try to shoot yourself in the right, face. Right, so there's one piece. The disc is called a merchant, and the cube is called a trader. Okay. How the <laughs> fuck are you going to keep that straight? Well, do you draw them from your stockpile of merchant traders or your supply? My supply or my stockpile? Mm, no. Fuck that. We called it the disc and the cube. Yep. And, and we the, called it the, the graveyard and the whatever. The graveyard and the supply. No, the graveyard and the bag. The bag. And the general term. The bag is an action. And the general term, discs and cubes collectively are dudes. So, for example, you must play a disc on this place, but you may return a dude from your supply, yep. meaning either a disc or a cube. Yeah. Seriously, don't like the rule book. Just cross out. There are problems with the rule book besides the fact that it names things weirdly. That we had this game taught to us by multiple people multiple times, and they all got shit wrong until Rim read the rules extremely carefully and referred to Board Game Geek multiple times. And to while I was reading everything. them, was repeatedly swearing out loud. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we might the- even still be playing it wrong, but I doubt it. Yeah, I think we're pretty good now. Right. So anyway, the way the game works is that you, you have uh, dudes, cubes and discs, right? And you put them on the board on these roads, and each road has a number of spaces. Once you've filled it, it takes you know actions to get guys out there and fill up a road, but eventually you fill up a road, then you can use an action to score the road. When you score the road, you can usually just put one of your dudes at the end of the road. Either end, if there's there's two ends. Every road has two ends, except for the ending roads. Those have two ends. uh, Yeah, every road has two ends. They have to. Yeah, I guess so. Um, But anyway, and then you put your guy, one of your guys who is on the road, into the space on the end of the road. Now, if any road that has it is touching that guy, right, you're going to get points, pretty much, when people score in that general area. But... There are a few roads that are magic roads, and if you score on those, you can score normally, or you can upgrade your shit to be more efficient. So you have a little eclipse-style thing in front of you, meaning you've got a board where you put a bunch of cubes and discs on it, covering up things, and to upgrade, when you do that action, you take a cube or disc off of the appropriate spot, put it into your bag a.k.a. your supply, and then your power is upgraded. So you lift a cube off the Axiones, and now Daddy 3 yeah. Axiones. So the, the, f- the things you can upgrade is you can upgrade your Axiones. We're going to use is, our terms, not the game's terms. Right, well, Axiones, I think, is also the game's term. But it, anyway, it's just actions. Yeah, it's just more actions. So obviously that's a, a, that's a basic thing to go for. It's not a bad thing to go for at all. Yep, for um, example, take two actions. It's generally just good to get more actions. It's just on your turn. How many actions? I get five actions? It's like actions? having a baby in Agricola. It's pretty strong. <laughs> yep. Uh, the bag. So the bag is in one of the actions you can take is to get guys from the graveyard into the supply so or you can bag. only yeah you can only use guys who are in who are not in the graveyard so being able to get more guys out of the graveyard with a single action basically saves you actions so upgrading that is very similar to upgrading your actiones in that it increases your efficiency of getting shit done yep there's um, the Lieber Sophia or as we call them Liebers right, or so, just discs so the Liebers is really powerful the Lieber is one of the actions you can use is to helicopter guys around the board. So it's sometimes you might be able to get guys onto the board for free, but they'll be in a bad place. So you can use the heli- the Lieber helicopter to move guys. The more you upgrade the Lieber, the more guys you can move with a single action. That's really freaking strong. And also upgrading it, remember the mechanic I said mm-hmm. is Eclipse style. You take the cube, or in this case the disc, off of that area yeah. and bring it into your bag. So, so now you have more discs. Right, discs so you start the powerful. game with one disc and there's four discs sitting on the board to get more those four extra discs, well, three extra discs, you need to upgrade the lever, which is upgrading the helicopter power. There's right? the privilegium, as we like to call it. All right, so there are certain places on the board where you can't put a guy because they're upgraded colors, and you need to upgrade your privilegium, right, your privilege, to go into those spaces. Yeah, mini, maxi, and maximum. So there's like there's a lot of spaces where like no one can go, and there won't be any competition for those spaces because people don't have privilegium. So if you get privilegium, you can just go there uncontested, and it's pretty freaking strong. Yep. And the final upgrade is the key. The key doesn't do anything to make you more efficient. It's a score multiplier it just, at the end of the game. It multiplies one of the scoring aspects of the game. So it's the network aspect. So if you have a large network of dudes 
includes in houses on the board at the end of the game, you get a lot of points for that. The key will multiply the number of points you get for that if you upgrade the key. So that can be really strong scoring-wise, but if you don't have a big network or if the game is very short, not allowing anyone to build a big network, upgrading the key is pretty futile. Yep, it doesn't do anything for you until the end. Right. So now, usually terms- the key gets rushed at the end, but it's really easy to get early. So maybe you just go for it early. No, but then never, never. if the game doesn't go long, you just wasted that shit. And if someone else goes for the key early, maybe try to rush the game so it ends quickly so their key is useless. Because so if, the, if they went key early and the game goes long, they're just going to win. So to give you a sense of all these multiple paths to victory, you can form a network. So as you put guys in these towns, you, they're your largest contiguous branching network. Mm-hmm. So not a line like most games, but just every everything that can get to everything else. The biggest branch you can possibly make. Blob, basically. You just multiply the number of dudes you've got out there in that branch times the key value, which goes up to four. Which can be tremendous. That, can that be, alone will just win the game. I've seen people get 20, 30 plus More points. points than any other scoring mechanism combined, right? You also get get points at the end of the game for every special disc you use. We'll talk about those last, the yeah, plates. The plates. You also get points for every city that you control in terms of having a lot of guys in those cities. Like, you're controlling that one city. Yeah, it's like, okay, I didn't make a network, but I just got control of a lot of spots, you know, so that's times two. That's pretty strong. And there's the colon table where you can upgrade there and put a disc into it just to get a big fuck ton of victory points at the end. It's pretty much just... Get points. And usually that's the way to get a lot of points if you have privilege. Well, when Roe filled up three of those things. Yeah, you need privilegum to get those colon points, except for the lowest one. And that adds up because it's like, what, 8, 9, 10, 11 or something like that? Or 9, 10, 11, 12? Uh, the top one's 11. All right, so it's 8, 9, 10, 11. What's 8 plus 9 plus it's 10 It's not 8, plus 9. 11? There's a bigger jump. I forget the number. It's like oh, 7, 8, 9, 11. Whatever. It's a big freaking score if you can get more than one in there. So upgrading your privilegum and then getting colons is just a pile of points. You can ignore the rest of the game. But you are giving up your discs to make that happen. Yeah, you need to get Liebers also. So if you go all Lieber, all Privilegum, then you can go colon and get those points. <laughs> Seriously, you might think we're being dumb for not using the terminology in the book. The book fucking sucks. Mm-hmm. So the way you actually play, and that, well, oh, there's more points. If you control the city, anyone who scores I, that city from any road... Yeah, I talked about that already. Yeah, you get a point. There's some bonus points for scoring certain places and putting your dudes on them. So scoring in a hot area early. So like, if I go to the city that's touching the Axiones road and I put a dude in it early, anyone else who tries to upgrade their Axiones is going to end up giving me a point when they do so. Unless I immediately jump in there with my privilegum. Sure. And get above you. But that's then you're not getting an Axione either. Yep. But you also get points. And I get a point when you do that. At the two ends of the map, there's two red flag cities. Mm. If you connect them with dudes... Which happens more often than you think it would. You get a pile of points. And all these, all this second set of points we talked about, you get during the game. Yep. The rest of the points are at the end, and that's key. Because the way the games end are, one, if all, if ten of the cities on the board get full of dudes... Never happened in every, any game I've played ever. Two, if... The I think the better order to do this. And so plates two, plates run out. Yep. If the special plates that we haven't talked about yet are all taken, yeah. And there's some nuance around that, but it's pretty straightforward Whatever. if you read the if rules. The plates closely. run out. Yep. Or three, if anyone gets to 20 points. Now the scoring track goes all the way around the board to 100, which makes you think, aha. The end of game scoring, right, is really most of the points. And you know what? In it a can lot of, be. In a lot of games, it is. But because that, that end of game score is so low, just 20, it's possible to rush it may, and me, preventing anyone from having a large end of game scoring. Scores, scores overall will be low, and those 20 points that you got really quickly might just be enough to end the game. So there's another reason the game. this game is so interactive. The actions you can take, the actual things you do with your actiones. Now, again... On your cheat sheet eclipse board, there are five little reminders as to what the actions do. They are worse than bullshit. They will confuse you. I would recommend cutting them off of your game. Mm. I would actually recommend blacking them out, putting stickers over them. They Anyone new who tries to look at those things just gets confused as to what they mean. Mm-hmm. They're literally worthless. Mm-hmm. But you can pull guys out of your bag. You can put guys on the board. You can move guys around with your Libra helicopter. You can score something. Scoring takes an action. Mm -hmm. Or, and here's where the game gets doubly interactive, you can displace someone from a spot they're already on on the road. So let's say there's a road to upgrade Axiones, right? And 
Uh, I put two guys on it, one, two. Then Rim goes, and he puts a guy in the third spot, and that's that's the whole road. Well, in order to score the road, I have to have the road have three guys on it that are all mine. So either, A, I leave those guys there forever, pointlessly. Yep. B, I helicopter them away to a different road. Or C, I bump Rim off that road, taking control of it and allowing myself to score it. But if I bump Rim off, I have to spend not only one guy to put a guy there in place of Rim's guy, but another guy has to go into the graveyard who had to fight Rim. And then I get to take the guy he bumped and put him on an adjacent road, and I get to take a guy from my graveyard and put him on the board. So he basically gets a free action of putting a guy onto the board and a free action of getting the guy out of the graveyard. So it super helps someone when you bump them off. So getting bumped is a, is a really reactionary thing. People are trying to get bumped sometimes, but sometimes they don't want Get right, well, it's like if you upgrade your bag, allowing you to get guys out of your graveyard really efficiently, then you want to be a bumper, right? Because it's so easy for you to bump people off. You have tons of extra guys. But if you keep bumping people, you obviate their need to ever bag. Right, if you're getting bumped a lot, you can just upgrade your lever and helicopter, right? And then when someone bumps you, it's like, okay, I have to move my... I get extra guys on the board, but they're in a shitty location, but that's fine, because I'll just helicopter them into place really efficiently. So the Lieber discs, the merchants, I guess? To bump them, you gotta bump two daddies. Two guys go into the graveyard, and then the guy you bumped gets two extra guys out of his that's graveyard. That's why Lieber is so strong. Just upgrade Lieber, put discs out, and then get people to bump your discs off, and you'll get all these free guys on the board without having to upgrade your bag, and then because you upgraded Lieber already, you can helicopter them into the good position really quickly. So with all of this, there's also special plates, and you're going to fuck those rules up like three or four times before you get it right. There's always supposed to be three on the board unless the game is over. So many games we've played with all smart people, we ended up with two on the board, one on the board, five on the board. Yep. How and the fuck did that happen? <laughs> every it, We all fucked it up. Yep. So at the end of every turn, our meme, what we always say is, is plate integrity maintained? Yeah. And then everyone has to agree that it is before we continue to the next turn. Yep. The plates, if you score a road that has a plate pointed at it, you get the plate. And then you can take a new plate to put somewhere on the board. The plates have powers like remove three dudes from the board or, hey, guys, four extra actions right now. Yeah. Some of the plates are just obviously more strong, like the five, four or five extra actions at once. But I find those to be weaker. I like the, uh, the swap very, a dude. Very strong. And, and I like the remove three dudes. The swap one can be very strong in the right situation. But in other situations, it can be worthless, right? The remove three dudes is ridiculously strong in just about any situation. Oh, and the plates are all... Especially if your bag is not upgraded The plates well. are also worth points. The more you get, the more points each one is worth. Right, so it's like you can just play for the plates, and then using the plates also helps you get more plates and more other things also. So I've seen people win this game ignoring everything and just trying to get every plate as fast as possible. Yeah, it can, ha and that ends the game as well. So even if no one gets to 20 points, if you get enough plates, you can end the game pretty quickly. This this is a game, primarily, if you want to talk about the skills involved, of predicting what other players' strategies are and coming up with the best counter to them while simultaneously obfuscating what you're doing mm -hmm. or putting yourself into such a position of strength that people can't stop you. Yeah, it's not a game where I can tell you, like settlers, just do this one of these two things every game. It's like, all right, you have to really assess what's going on in the whole lay of the land every turn, see what everyone's doing, and there will be a different path to go every different game based on what people have done. Yep, and your path might change mid-game. So you also just might be fucked based on where you're sitting or something. Yep. A pretty powerful strategy I've found is to... Focus on a few things, like I'll upgrade your actions a little bit. And yeah, just focus on bit. something basic early on until you see the lay of the land. Yep, and wait and see and hope that people move the game in a certain direction that you can then react to and capitalize on the fact that you were waiting for them to move. Mm -hmm. The theme of the game has something to do with the, 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 the uh, Hanseatic League. Yeah, and it it's, doesn't exist. We can't figure out what the fuck is going on. Yeah, we ignore all the theming Trading, the game. some shit, whatever. Who cares? That's why there's that game, like games like Puerto Rico or uh, Tigers and Euphrates to this day hold this extra tier for us. Because one, they're extremely complex, well thought out mechanically as games. But two, the theme is integrally woven into the games in such a wonderful and nuanced way that a lot of more modern games just don't do. Mm. This game has terrible iconography. It's extremely confusing without a very specific and detailed explanation of how to upgrade everything and how everything works. From someone who read the rules 20 times and, yep. and the internet. 
But uh, otherwise, it's a really solid game. I'm really surprised it held up as... I mean, Third and Taxes, which we loved, didn't make it through four playthroughs before we figured it out and we were done with it. Yep. This game... I think it'll have a decent bit of staying power. Well, and everyone seems to really a lot like, like it. like Ticket to Ride, basically. Yeah. This is more like those older German board games with cubes mm. in a lot of ways. Mm. Another, I'll point out, you know, if we're talking about strategy, if you upgrade your actions or your bag once, you get an immediate bonus. If you upgrade your actions a second time, you don't get a bonus. You have to upgrade it a third time. So... It's usually not worth it to try to blitz actions hard. Your best bet is to blitz actions as fast as possible just to get to three actions. And then you don't need that fourth action immediately. You can do that opportunistically if you're clever. Yeah, it's like if there's an opportunity, just be like helicopter score with two actions to get that uh, actionist upgraded, I would go for it. Yeah, but don't spend three turns orchestrating your four actions early game that you get much more bang for your buck getting that third action and then going somewhere or else. Or getting bag one bag upgrade, which is probably easier to get and is also going to save you actions. Yep, if all the other players are like just having this death match with discs everywhere around the actions, go upgrade your key and your privilege a whole bunch. Yeah. <laughs> or just start taking cities in the middle. Yep. <laughs> that's it. People forget they can take cities in this well, game. That's sometimes. another thing is that usually in a game, right, there's like a hot spot where all the valuable shit is and people fight over that. In this game, there's valuable shit all over the place. There's not like areas of the board that are dead. Why would you ever go there? It's like, no, the whole board is hot. There'll be a plate over there that's looking hot. There'll be a, a nice city you can get over there, easy connection, right? You can go for the colon. If no one's going for the colon, it's like, that's worth a ton of points. It's pretty yep. hot. If you just sneak oh, in there once. everyone's going for all those other hot things. I'll just take some action, eh? right? It's just hot stuff everywhere. And you'll see, once people, if you play with people who've played a lot, there'll be cubes all over the place. Not just in like one area that's awesome. Yep. Now, it's interesting. The game takes two to five players, but there are three variants to accomplish that. Two player has this thing where there's these knights that move around. I haven't played it. We haven't either. People say it's not that great. Okay. Uh, Three and two and three, well, two and three player use one side of the board. Four and five player use another side of the board that has just more connections between cities. Mm hmm. I think the game is best with three or five players. Mm. Board Game Geek says the game is best with five players. Mm. But three and five are very different, kind of like the difference between three and five in Puerto Rico. Mm. Very different strategies, very different game. I worry that with four players, the board's a little too open. Yeah. And But I think four players doesn't work on the smaller one, so I think you should try to avoid playing with four people. Go for three or five. Mm. So, I don't know what else I can say. I mean, you guys should play this game. If uh, you're playing board games, play this one. So, Andreas Stedding, it's interesting, because I actually didn't know who he was, and he doesn't seem to have a lot of games, at least that are known in the U.S., to his name. Mm -hmm. Like, Scottish Highland Whiskey Race. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I don't care what that game is. He, he, uh, Hispania is the only one that I've heard of. Okay. I mean, Italia, I've seen, but I've never played. Heart of Africa, I've seen, but I've never played. Uh, oh, the Hansa Teutonic expansion. I need that. All right. God damn it. Who knows what's in that thing? Yeah, I kind of really want it now. Okay. And it doesn't look like he's published anything since 2010. Huh. Maybe he's working on a masterpiece. 